Thank you so much for joining me today on Just Praise Him Radio. I'm your host, Glenda Lomax, and my job is to inspire you to a closer walk with Christ. Now here's the show. Please note, this episode is not suitable for children under the age of 16. Hello, believers. Welcome to the Just Praise Him radio show. I'm your host, Glenda Lomax, and the title of my message today, and this is an updated thing for the Warfare series, the title of my message is How Demons Gain Access to Humans. I did a podcast by the same name back in 2012. But now I've got new stuff in it, so I think y'all are going to like it. Have you ever been plagued by the urge to do a certain sin over and over in spite of your efforts to stop doing that sin? The presence of demonic influences in our lives can make it nearly impossible to stop sinning in some area without first removing the demonic influences. So I want to teach you how demons gain access to us and how they gain access even to children so you can gain the knowledge you need to make them leave. Remember, Hosea 4, 6 says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. We don't want to be among the people that that applies to, do we? It is important to understand how demons gain access to you and your household because you will have no peace if your house is full of demons. You will have a lot of sickness, addiction, poverty, and other types of destruction in your house if it's full of demons, but no peace. Demons bring only destruction, just like their master, Satan. Also, you need to get the demons out of your own life before you start trying to command them in someone else's life. The first battle in spiritual warfare training is always to clean out the demons in your own life and your environment. It is also important to learn how demons get access to you, not only so you can get rid of them, but so you can not let any more in, and also because how they access you and others give them what's called a legal right to be there, and you will not be able to cast them out until you deal with the legal rights. No demon wants to be in hell. They want to be up here. Hell is dark and stinky and nasty. Nobody wants to be there. They want to be up here where the air conditioning is, all right? There is no light there, there's no Jesus, there's no love, and there's no mercy. So they fight to stay with any legal loophole that they can find. We need to learn how to not give them any loopholes. So let's talk briefly about people, places, and things. It is very important that you are always aware of the attitudes and habits of the people you are around because of the transference capability of demons. They don't usually just jump on you walking down the street, but through close contact. Most of the time, demons gain access to us through our own sin and sinful thoughts. Another common way for them to gain access is through soul ties that we have with another person. It is extremely important to be aware if you are in contact with somebody who is on drugs, who's practicing witchcraft, who is involved in the occult or involved in Satanism especially. Contact with people involved in these activities will help you get demonized fast. And before you know it, you will need a truckload of church folks to help you get free again. If you think you may have a demon attached to you, or maybe there's one on one of your children or family member, something like that, look back and see if you can remember when the behavior that demon is causing began. Do you have any idea how it got on you or on them? This information is helpful during deliverance if you happen to have it. One of the main signs that a demon has attached to you is you suddenly have a strong urge to commit certain behaviors or to say profanity or commit immoral acts or something like that. Let's say you have a behavior and you get delivered at your church and a few weeks later, the urge to do that behavior comes right back really strong. How could it be back? You know you were set free. When this happens, there's often a curse in place which causes an open door. In the case of a curse, we find the curse, break it properly, and then boot the demons out again, and this time they won't have a way back in. If you have never learned about spiritual warfare before, demons are usually named after what they do. Like a demon that causes a bad anger problem is a spirit of anger. A demon that causes depression is called a spirit of depression. A demon that causes lust is called 
a spirit of lust. If a demon continually comes back after you do deliverance, after you have cast it out, it either has a legal right or you are opening the door to it. Demons do not like to lose their host. And guess what? You're the host. The person they're attached to is called the host. It's like when you host a guest in your house. They don't like to lose their host because then they have to go back to hell and they don't want to do that. Okay, so one of the ways that demons can gain access to us is through soul ties. You can have a soul tie with a family member, a friend, a co-worker. All romantic relationships create soul ties. All sexual intimacy, pornography, etc. creates a, a soul tie. Marriage creates a very strong soul tie. A soul tie is like a spiritual tunnel where demons can, can transfer from that person directly into your soul. Let me give you an example. In the summer of 2011, I spoke at a meeting in McKinney, Texas, and did some deliverance on a very sweet sister who walked in purity, was really sold out to the Lord. She was very devout. And she started telling me, you know, everything was fine. And then suddenly I can't pray, I can't worship, and I can't feel God's presence. And she said, I don't know what it is, but it's really scaring me. Would you please pray for me? So a group of us surrounded her and I began to pray. And the Lord said, it's a curse. So I told her and I kept praying. And he revealed it's a curse of unbelief. And he showed me it had entered through a former unbelieving spouse that she was no longer with. The soul tie created by the marriage had never been broken and was still in place. And the unbelief had come to her through the soul tie. So I explained to her and I said, okay, a curse has to be handled a little bit differently than just casting out a demon. A curse comes into place when there is sin that is not repented of. So she had to repent of the sin of marrying an unbeliever before we could break the curse and then cast out the demon. As soon as the demon was cast out, she could pray and worship and feel God's presence again. Another way that demons can access humans is through generational iniquity or generational curses. Same concept. Generational curses come into place when there is sin in the father's bloodline, not the mother's, only the father's, that no one repented of meaning that the man did the sin, but he didn't repent. Generational curses on you are in place after that father or forefather passes, since the sin is still active on them if they are alive. Exodus 20, verse 5, referring to graven images. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the father's upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Notice that says the sins of the fathers, not the sins of the mothers. And I asked the Lord about that one time. I said, Lord, what about the sins of the mom? What if they were all wrapped up in witchcraft or some other terrible thing? And he said, only the sins of the fathers. He said, why do you think Jesus could have an earthly mother, but not an earthly father? And I thought, okay, that makes sense. Because if Jesus had an earthly father, there would have been sin in his DNA like there is in ours. He could not have been, then been a perfect sacrifice because sacrifices must be without blemish. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. That iniquity is going to fall on the children of the fathers who hate God or don't believe in him. If those children later become believers, then the curses can be removed, but they do have to remove them. Okay, the number one way that demons access humans is through our own sin and sinful thoughts that we entertain. The minute we so much as entertain a thought about sinning, a demon can attach to us, period. The minute the enemy can drop a wicked imagination into your mind, that's how fast you can get a demon. Anytime a wicked imagination drops itself into your mind, you're faced with two choices. Let's say you're a guy and you're sitting at your desk on Monday, minding your own business, doing your work, and an adulterous thought drops in for a visit. You're faced with two choices. One, you can say, wicked imagination, I call you a trespasser. You're not from the Lord my God. I cast you down to the deepest pit in the abyss in Jesus' name. Go now and take your filth and your seeds with you. And you don't even have to say that very loud. You can just whisper it. Or, number two, you can say, yeah, sister so-and-so in the next cubicle, she is pretty cute. I think she kind of likes me. Hmm. And pick up a new demon or two to carry around with you. See how fast it can happen? 
Many people ask, can a Christian be possessed? Can demons possess humans? No, but humans can possess demons. They can attach to us and influence our thoughts and behaviors and cause other problems like sickness and addiction and all that. Let's talk about thoughts that keep coming back and coming back and coming back. Anytime the devil finds something that works on you to tempt you or make you sin, he's going to keep doing it, okay? Pornography is one of the best examples of this. Not surprising since we live in a hypersexualized culture. Also because pornography is done through images, okay? Lustful thoughts that keep coming back and coming back and coming back once they get through the door of pornography are a problem. And by the way, while on, we're on the subject of pornography, be aware that demonic spirits can attach to images like magazine pictures or photographs, like somebody takes a picture of themselves, and to the moving images or movies. This is something the Lord taught me back in about 2000 or 2001. So when you buy the latest issue of Playboy or Hustler and take it home, guess what? You got a lot of pictures and some free demons to boot. What a deal. And by the way, if you mess around with pornography or any other sin very long, you get what's called a stronghold. Stronghold is basically a whole nest of like-minded demons attached to you, and that is a real battle to tear back down. We're going to talk more about that in a minute. I'm just saying. The choice to sin and do that sin is yours. I'm just telling you what the consequences will look like. Every action in our lives has a consequence. So let's say you do buy the latest issue. And let's say you have a particular imagination about one of the pictures that you keep thinking about. And then a month or so later, you have a new imagination about it. So you entertain that imagination. In comes a second demon or four or five with the new imagination. And the cycle keeps repeating itself until pretty soon you have a whole nest of demons related to sexual immorality attached to you. And eventually, if you continue, it will take you a long fast and an 18-wheeler full of Christians to get you free again. At one point, when I was writing the first Spiritual Warfare series I taught, I asked the Lord, I said, I, why just dealing with what seemed like one demon over and over again while trying to get free of something seems to create a stronghold? And I saw a vision of a fort. And there was a bunch of demons that were defending it. And <laughs> kind of reminded me of a John Wayne movie. And he showed me that when they nest up together like that, when you have one after another after another coming in, like with a pornography situation or something like that, that they all work together to defend their position. And that is what makes it a stronghold. You're casting out one demon and three more show up the next day and you or you entertain those thoughts and do those sins and you get more and more. And while we're on this subject, let me share a very important story with you. Back in about, I think it was about 2010 or so, I had a friend in Dallas. He was a young black man who had contacted me online early on in the ministry and asked for help getting delivered of homosexuality. He would call me and I would do deliverance on what we thought was there. You know, we would talk about what was going on and everything. And then he would slip up again that weekend. And the next week, like on Monday, he would call me again and ask for deliverance. And he wanted to be free. He really did. He was leading uh, worship at his church in Dallas. And at one time I visited his church and even preached at his church. And he wanted to work to walk right with the Lord and he didn't know where else to go to help. So I was trying to help him. But he was having a lot of trouble giving up that sin. And I did not know much about deliverance then. I helped him with what I did know. But, you know, I was still learning a whole lot of stuff. You never know everything about deliverance. So... It was a new week, and he called me again and told me some stuff that had been going on in a dream he'd had that had revealed to me the name of one of the main demons that was influencing his behavior. So I opened my mouth and was about to cast that one out, and the, lo the Lord spoke to me very clearly, and he said, Stop. Do not deliver him. And I said, Lord, why not? And the Lord said, If you deliver him, you will hurt him. And I said, How would it hurt him? And he said, Because he is not ready to give up that sin and each one of the demons you cast out is going to come back with seven more wicked. And I was like, <gasps> so I told him, I said, I can't do it. And I told him why. And he committed to try to work harder to lay down the sin. And the Lord then spoke a word to him through me that if he returned one more time to that sin, he was not going to live very much longer. And he received the word. He was a very humble person. He was a really nice guy. A few years later, he wrote me a letter from his deathbed. They told me that he died about two days later. 
this is only one of the reasons I don't go around performing deliverance on people. And this, with this young man, I've seen this kind of thing before, not with that particular sin, with, but with other things. In cases where the Lord goes, okay, I'm going to take you out if you don't stop doing that, they seem to be related to people who are going around saying, I'm a Christian, and they hold a position at their church, and they're acting all crazy like that. So I'm just saying. Keep that in mind if you are someone who has a position at your church and you're in a lot of sin because God may let you know about that. This is one of several reasons I do not go around performing deliverance on people. People need to learn to cast out their own demons. One of us will not always be around to get you delivered. Anytime you put yourself on the line and you do deliverance for somebody, you are risking retaliatory attacks, okay? You will discover in doing spiritual warfare, the devil and his demons do not just lay down and go, oh, okay, you, we'll just do whatever you want us to. No, they fight back. If you do not know the person's walk that you're trying to get delivered, you could hurt them by opening the door for those demons you're casting out to come back with seven more wicked, like in that case. If getting rid of demons is work for you, but not for them, they have no real motivation to leave this in, do they? Consequently, I only do deliverance for family members or extremely close friends whose walks I am familiar with. So repeatedly fantasizing like happens with pornography will bring you a stronghold. But pornography is not the only thing that we can fantasize about. If you are angry with someone, maybe you fantasize about revenge. If you've ever seen it, any documentary about a serial killer, you will see that the majority of them fantasized for years about killing, and then finally the urge in them was so strong, because by then they had a whole nest of demons there, that they acted out their fantasies. The demons drove them to commit those awful crimes. All they knew was that they had an overpowering urge to do them. That is where those desires come from. That's how they got there. Every time they fantasized, the door was open to more demons. And it is for you too. There's something you have to understand about demons. Demons act out their natures through people. A demon of lust has a nature of lust, but it cannot act out its desires without a human body. So it has to attach to you to act out its lustful nature. A demon of anger is the same way. It does not have a body to act out anger, so it has to attach to you to act out its anger. A demon of murder has to attach to a host to commit murder. A demon of violence has to attach to a host to commit violence. So you see how that works? Demons express their natures into our world through human hosts. They gain access to you, attach, and start influencing you to do their sin. This is when you will begin feeling the urges to do this or that sin or desires to do something you may have never even thought about doing before. People often ask if a Christian can be possessed by demons. Absolutely not. They can be oppressed, but not possessed. Demons cannot possess a Christian, but Christians definitely possess demons. Another thing I want to make you aware of while we're talking about demons gaining access is that children are extremely susceptible to demonic influence. And children as young as two years old can display signs of a generational curse. Uh, if you ever see a very small child like that, and they're doing things like playing with knives and talking about killing people. That's usually a generational curse of murder. That does happen. I've heard of stories where it's happened, and that's what it means. That's not cute little child's play when they're talking about, oh, I'm going to go kill aunt, you know, whoever. Our sins allow demons to access us, but another way that demons can access us is through the sins of others. Demons gain access to humans through sins like molestation and other childhood abuse. The percentage of people molested when they were children is pretty big. I think it was somewhere around 20% the last time I looked up the statistics. Whenever someone is molested, there will always be a demon of fear, there will be a demon of perversion, and there are some other demons in there too of a sexual nature. And depending on if it's same gender or opposite gender uh, offenders that are doing that. Anger is often one of the demons that come in with abuse, if the abuse goes on for a long time. Another demon that I discovered is called take it, and it's a demon that comes in with long-term abuse that causes the victim to just take the abuse for years and years and years. And then when they become adults, they will take the abuse because that demon is there influencing them to not fight back. 
And I tell you the names of a lot of these demons because if you go to deliver yourself uh, of abuse, you need to know, and I call it the hit list, you need to know what other demons to look for and cast out at the same time. Because the rule is, if you think a demon might be there, you go ahead and cast it out. No harm is done if it's not. But there is harm done if you leave it. Also, another way that demons can access you is through trauma. And um, it is also possible for animals to suffer trauma. Uh, The person that was staying with me not long ago whose house burned had left their dog in the house uh, because of no place else for it to go for about a week. And that dog was severely traumatized after that. In fact, that's how I learned that it could happen to animals. And so we cast out those demons, and now the dog is free and he's acting just like he did before. Speaking of trauma, severe, unexpected trauma causes post-traumatic stress disorder. PTSD is what that's called. And PTSD is defined as a disorder in which a person has difficulty recovering after experiencing or witnessing a terrifying event. That definition is the most accurate that I found, and it is from the Macomb County Community mental health site at mccmh.net. PTSD is what a lot of the Vietnam veterans came back with. My brother-in-law, may he rest in peace, had that. I am a PTSD survivor. I am not on any PTSD or any other mental or behavioral medications whatsoever. Have not been in decades. I want to explain to you, especially those who have not heard me before, what causes PTSD. It's not the trauma. Back in 1997, I was in Morgan City, Louisiana, doing an oil and gas permitting job. I had just given my life to the Lord in July of 96. I'd been saved about a year. I was on my first reading of the Bible all the way through, and I was in Matthew chapter 6 when I came one night when I came to verses 14 and 15, which say, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Let me read that again from the NLT for a more everyday language version for those of you who prefer a different version. If you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. Verse 15 grabbed my attention. Was there anyone I had not forgiven? I quickly made a list of everyone I could think of that I might not have forgiven. Then I prayed over them and released them one by one. And there was one name on the list I was struggling with. Rick, my children's dad. That was a bad marriage. He's departed now. I don't want to say more, but it was a very bad marriage. Finally, I dropped to my knees, crying out to God. Lord, I am not going to miss heaven for him. I spent enough time being miserable when I was with him. You've got to help me. How do I forgive him for all that awful abuse? I am not getting up off this floor until you help me. And I cried out. I just kept crying out for some minutes. I don't know how long it was. And then I felt a touch in my spirit, and I saw in the spirit the horrible abuse that he had suffered as a child, abuse he had never told me about. I knew he hated his dad, but not what had been done to him. When I saw what he suffered, forgiveness came like a waterfall. And all the pain, suffering, and anger I had felt was washed away. And along with it, almost every single memory I had of the abuse went over the falls too. I was so excited to be free from all that negativity. I had carried it by then 10 years just since I had left the marriage, and at least that many during the marriage. So 20 years of painful baggage. And it was gone the moment the Lord helped me forgive. Though I did not realize it at that moment, something else went over that waterfall. My PTSD. PTSD comes in during trauma. Trauma opens the door for it, but the only way it leaves is through forgiveness. It is actually caused by unforgiveness. You can drug it. You can counsel it. You can dress it up or down any way you want to. You can feed it 10 medicines a day, but it will not leave until you forgive. Matthew 18, 34, and his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. That's the parable of the unforgiving servant. Abuse, especially physical or sexual abuse, lets in a lot of trauma. Another thing that you will discover is that people who have suffered a lot of abuse, like my departed husband, often become abusers themselves. It is not because they are bad people. It is because there is a demon of abuse attached to them. 
urging them to do that thing and they don't know why they do it. And they can go to all the psychological counseling they want, but the urge will still be there because it has a spiritual root, not a behavioral root. Another thing to understand is that anytime there is a demon attached to someone urging them to act out and do a certain thing, it also acts as a magnet, drawing that same kind of behavior to them, which means his father also had that demon. Have you ever noticed when an abused person leaves a marriage, they always seem to, seem to end up married to another abuser? That's because of the abuse magnet. Another thing to know is demons act in two ways, outwardly and inwardly. Take the demon of murder, for example. It can act outwardly by committing murder or homicide on another person through its host, or it can commit murder inwardly by influencing its host to commit suicide. Anytime you see a murder-suicide, that is what you are seeing. The demon of murder committed the murder of another person, and then it committed murder on its host. A demon of abuse has an assignment to cause abuse. It doesn't care who gets the abuse. It's just supposed to cause abuse. So the demon of abuse will cause a person to abuse another person or sometimes even to abuse its own, its own host. And then it draws abuse to the host. Demon of anger. I had a demon of anger attached to me years and years ago, and I did not understand why we do stuff like flip out and throw something across the room because I'm a very calm, quiet person. I said, Lord, this is not me. What is going on with this? And he let me know that there was a demon of anger that had attached to me as a small child. Something happened to me, and I began to throw tantrums, which my parents attributed to my red hair, but it was not my red hair. It was a demon. But I, I pretty much embodied that, that saying that you see on T-shirts, God gave me red hair because I needed a warning label. So demons can attach to you as a child. That demon of anger attached to me as a young child. The scripture says, be ye angry and sin not. The reason it says that is if you are angry and you sin, then that demon of anger gains access to you and other demons. You can be angry and not sin, and it's not going to have access. But if you're angry and you do sin, the demon has the right to attach to you. It causes more anger problems. Violence is a demon. Violence done to you can cause that demon to attach to you. A demon of violence can access you when you are a child. Hate is a demon, and hate and murder run together, by the way. And there are also generational curses of hatred. Racism is a generational curse of hatred. Rage is a demon. I've seen that one before. Rage can come in with molestation if it's long-term, and I've seen that before, especially if it went on for years and years and years, and especially if someone knew about it and didn't help. It attaches because the child felt helpless and scared and angry about what was happening to them. Another way demons can access humans is through the death of someone close. This is especially true with the spirit of suicide. Suicide will always do its best after it has killed its host to try to cause a chain reaction. By jumping to someone near the deceased and working on them, then the next one, and the next one, and so on. And sometimes you will see a chain reaction in action in a family. It will continue taking out as many members of a family as it can until somebody checks it and makes it stop. It attempted that in my family but failed. Anytime you see a suicide like in a high school and then you see another one, another one, another one, that's what you're seeing. Remember the story of the man of the Gadarenes who lived among the tombs? I want to read you that story and just point out a couple of things that I noticed in it. It's in um, Mark chapter 5, starting in verse 1, the one I'm going to read. And I'm reading from the King James. And they came over unto the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. The tombs are a place of remembrance, by the way who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains. Because he had, often, he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. Okay, he had supernatural strength, and that is very common, by the way, in someone who is possessed. That is not just in the movies. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. If he was cutting himself, his, himself, he was abusing himself. 
But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshiped him and cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the most high God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. Now, why would he say that? Let me just tell you. The demon said, I adjure you that you would not torment me because we can torment the demons. And that is one of my favorite things to do is torture demons, by the way. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. You see, demons are assigned to a particular region. Now there was there nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding. And all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine, that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave. And the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine. They entered into the swine. So that right there tells us demons can enter animals. That's kind of scary when you think about it, isn't it? And the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. They were about 2,000 and were choked in the sea. Okay, swine are pigs, if you don't know that. And that made, when they ran into the sea, that made me wonder if there was a demon of suicide in them, or if that was one of the spirits that was in the man that was possessing him. And some people think, oh, why would Jesus cause, you know, another Jew to lose all that, you know, his investment in all those pigs? Jews don't raise pigs. Jews don't eat pork. And they that had fed the swine fled and told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see what it was that was done. And they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And they that saw it told them how it befell to him that was possessed with the devil and also concerning the swine. And they began to pray him to depart out of their coasts. And when he was come into the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends, and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee, and hath had compassion on thee. And he departed, and began to publish in Decapolis, how great things Jesus had done for him, and all men did marvel. So the whole thing was to glorify God, and to show that he had the authority to do that. The stories in the Bible teach you a lot if you're paying attention to them. They teach you about God's personality. They teach you about God's way of doing things. And there's little clues here and there that you'll find about other things if you pay attention. Okay, have you ever been around somebody who was really controlling and manipulating, who had to have everything their way? Everything had to be done their way. It was their way or the highway. Have you ever been around somebody like that? Controlling and manipulating behavior brings in a demon of witchcraft. This behavior opens up a doorway to the enemy to attack the mind or the mental state of the person with things like mental illness, depression, etc. If you try to control and manipulate others and always get your way, you need to repent of that and cast out the related demons and ask the Lord to close that door for you. If you don't, that witchcraft will take its toll. Abandonment, ridicule, and rejection, and criticism also all bring in demons, by the way. Did you ever have an adult that spoke things over you like, you're just like your father. You'll never amount to anything, blah, blah, blah. If a parent speaks something like this over a child or a spouse or anybody, that is a word curse, and you need to break the power of those words in Jesus' name. Anytime you put a word curse like this on someone, you are also planting a harvest of that to come up in your own life, and it will because God is never mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that he will also reap. Galatians 6, 7. We bless or curse every time we speak. I have seen this so many times, especially women who just continually criticize their husbands. And I would refer you to Proverbs 14, 1 that says, A wise woman builds her house. A foolish one plucks it down. It's not very smart to, to tear down the house you're living in while you're living in it. So that word curse will activate on them, but guess who also gets a harvest of that same thing? You do. And there is not anything you can do to make that harvest not come. 
spreading slander about someone falls under this same area. That is also manipulative behavior because you are trying to manipulate other people's opinion of someone. When you spread slander and lies about another person, you reap a harvest of slander and lies about yourself. Proverbs 10, 18, he that hides hatred with lying lips and he that utters slander is a fool. Okay, so we were talking about soul ties earlier, that anytime you have any kind of a relationship with another person, a soul tie is created and that relationship is over. And even sometimes when it's not, you need to sever that soul tie so their demons cannot access you. Richard Ng has written numerous books about spiritual warfare. In one of his books, he wrote a story that there was this man that approached him who was being plagued by demons. And as he began to pray for him, it was revealed that he had an aunt who was practicing witchcraft. So he told him, and the man had never broken the this, this soul tie with the aunt. The aunt was still alive. So he had him break the soul tie. The minute he severed the soul tie, the problem stopped and he was free. Those demons were accessing him through that soul tie. Okay, demons can be in charge of regions. Okay, and they're pretty much every nation, every state, every city, every region. And many, if not all, neighborhoods and even some churches have a ruling demon or principality assigned to it. Have you ever driven through a neighborhood where you see nothing but widespread poverty? then you would know that the ruling spirit or territorial demon over that neighborhood is poverty. Often you will find lesser demons helping the ruling spirit, of course. In poverty-stricken neighborhoods around Dallas, there were sometimes violence and addiction spirits, you know, that sort of thing, helping bring the destruction. Have you ever driven through a really wealthy neighborhood? Those are often ruled by pride, greed, prestige, etc. You will also often find Jezebel in those particular neighborhoods and sometimes abuse in both both types of neighborhoods. The good news is, if you live in those neighborhoods, you can bind some of that stuff up by doing spiritual warfare. I highly recommend asking the Lord for permission before you do that if you are not sure you have an anointing to war regionally because it can bring retaliation, and I've suffered retaliation like that before. I took a whooping in Princeton for that very thing. The demons pinned me down to the bed, and I literally could not get up out of my own bed. I couldn't do anything and because I'd been fighting the regionals because I wanted to the town to get better because God had assigned me there. And I assumed, apparently wrongfully, that if I was assigned to a place, I could war against the, the regionals. So the Lord had to speak to somebody I knew that was teaching me some demonology and have him call me on the phone from like three states away and get me get me free so I could get out of bed. You have to remember if you go into these different places, you're in their territory and they won't take that lying down if you do spiritual warfare a lot. When I lived at the old house in Princeton, they attacked me. That was the house I moved to when I first went to Princeton in 08 or 09, whatever year it was that I moved there. When I moved across town to the townhouse, they left me alone. The regionals left me alone. But whenever I would go on a long trip, I would get attacked. And it was because I was going into a different principalities area, and they thought that I was there to do warfare against them. So apparently I picked up the anointing to war regionally somewhere in that time frame because that never used to happen before that. So I'm going to tell you this story I read someplace. I can't remember where I read it. But this is about places. I think I read it in one of the spiritual warfare books about this missionary who was passing out tracts on this one street. I want to say it's in Korea or someplace like that. And he went down one side of the street and everybody received the gospel and the tracts. Then he went to the other side of the street and the people were really mean. Nobody wanted to hear the gospel. They wouldn't take the tracts. And in one case, this one lady was really rude to him. So he crossed over to the nice side of the street. Later on, she crossed the street and he went up to her again. And this time she took the track and listened to the gospel. When he prayed and asked the Lord what the deal was, it was revealed that the street, what, that street was the dividing line between two spiritual territories. And so you wouldn't have any way to know that. Um, in one territory, one of the churches had a group of people that had been binding up the territorial spirits that were keeping the gospel from coming through. 
over their area. And in the other territory, there was not anybody doing that. So the side where everybody was really mean to him and would not accept the gospel were the side where nobody was binding up the territorial spirits that were keeping the gospel from breaking through. Isn't that interesting? In order to bind up those type of spirits, you got to do it all the time. They do not stay bound up. You don't bind them up once and they're bound up forever. You have to keep binding them again and again. It's a lot of work. I don't know why, but they get free pretty quick. But binding does work just uh, in the past year or so. I can't remember what I was warning against, but I bound this one demon. And I remember I'd been wondering about, you know, does this work or does it not work? And I saw in the spirit a, a man-shaped figure on the floor, and he was bound like a mummy. I mean, bound, y'all, real bound. And I thought, man, he can't move or anything. I was like, oh, yeah, that's good news. Also, while we are talking about places, sometimes you will go into this place or that place to eat, and you will see idols in those places of business. If you patronize that business or eat in that restaurant, you are running the risk of demons going back home with you, okay? You can still eat there if you want, but just be aware of that. It sounds extreme, but let me remind you that demonic spirits are all around us, and the truth is, it's way worse than what I'm telling you, okay? It is way worse. That's why we are constantly barraged with demonic influence, and they're going to be so much more active in these end times than they ever have been before since Jesus was on earth. You commonly see those kind of uh, idol statues in like um, Chinese restaurants and things like that, but you can in other ethnic restaurants too. I saw one in a donut shop in Princeton, y'all. I asked him, I said, what is that? And the guy goes, oh, that's the goddess of prosperity. And I thought, no, thank you. I don't think I'll have a donut today. So the demons that are all around us are going about doing their jobs and people are giving in to temptation, especially those people who don't know Jesus. If they don't know Jesus, why should they not give in to temptation and just do whatever they feel like? I checked into a hotel once on a trip, and I think I stayed three days. And <laughs> I was going out through the lobby to take my dogs out to do their business, and I felt a crowd over to my right, and I glanced over to see who it was, and I encountered a whole crowd of, guess what? Demon spirits. There was a bunch of idol god demons, like the kind that the Hindus worship. And since I had met the owners of the hotel I was staying in, it was clear how they got there. Most likely they prayed and offered sacrifices to those gods to bless their hotel. Well, I don't like demon gods around me, so I tortured them the entire time I was staying there. When I got back inside to my room after the first time that I saw them, I commanded all of them that every time I walked through there, they had to bow their knee to the king of kings who lives in me. I mean, really, how dare they stand in the presence of the king? And they did bow too. The next time I took my dogs out to do their business about four hours later, they were on their faces except for this one male one in a black suit standing behind the rest of them. And I don't know who he is, but he must have something to do with rebellion. So I tortured him even worse the whole time I was there. I made him lay prostrate and lick the floor any time the king was walking past, and he did. They must have been so happy they threw a party when I checked out of that hotel because I did not cut them any slack even for five minutes. Demons do not deserve your mercy. They never show us any. Okay, let's talk about things. Horror movies. This one should go without saying, but you would be surprised how many Christians think it's no big deal to watch horror movies. Horror movies bring demons into your house by the truckload, especially fear demons. If you don't want demons in your house, do not allow horror movies to be brought in or watched there. Anything with a demonic image on it, such as an album, a book, or a CD cover, or art that is occult-related, is an open door that allows demons access to you and your household and your family. Anything that has skulls, dragons, or snakes on it. Skulls are symbols of death. I know that's all the fashion now to wear stuff with skulls on it. I will not have anything in my house with a skull on it. Why would you want a spirit of death in your house around your family of all places? You might as well just tell the devil, come on in, as to have anything to do with an evil image in your home. Anything that has dragons or snakes on it. Satan is described as both a dragon and a serpent in the Bible. Okay, y'all, I'm going to stop right there for this episode because my voice is just tired. It's very tired. 
So there'll be an, there'll be a part two to this and you'll get more information. Okay. Thanks for listening. Jesus bless you. Y'all have a great week. Thank you so much for tuning in today to Just Praise Him Radio. You can contact me by mail at my new address, JPH Inc., Glenda Lomax, P.O. Box 60, Glencoe, Arkansas, 72539, or by email at jphtoday at gmail.com. JPH is not affiliated with any nonprofit organization, church, or denomination. Are there areas of sin in your life you just can't seem to overcome no matter how hard you try? Many people live their whole lives under curses without understanding they can be free. Learn what the scriptures say about curses and why they are still relevant today. Hosea 4.6 says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Learn how to defeat every curse through the power of the cross of Jesus Christ. If you have the knowledge, you can break curses off your life and start experiencing breakthroughs like never before. In the book Loosed from Chains of Darkness, you will learn the basics of four different types of curses. Loosed from Chains of Darkness is the most comprehensive curse-breaking book on the market today. Get your copy of Loosed from Chains of Darkness by Glenda Lomax, available on Amazon.com in print, Kindle, and audiobook versions. If you ask anyone you know what the most difficult experience of their life has been, many will answer about a time of betrayal. All those called to walk the narrow path will at some point encounter Judas. How will you respond? Do you know how to recognize Judas when he shows up in your life? Can you keep Judas from bringing destruction to your life and ministry? How can you minimize what Judas cost you? Can you pass the test of absolute betrayal? Get your copy of The Judas Test, available in print and new audiobook, The Judas Test by Glenda Lomax, available now on Amazon.com. Sold out for 30 pieces of silver? In Exodus 21, 32, it is the price of a dead slave. In Leviticus 27, 2 through 7, it is the price of a live one. Jesus was sold for the price of a bondservant. Precious Jesus, the Son of God, the Prince of Peace, the King of Kings, why did Judas sell his friend out so cheap?